All right, so to start off the uh, lecture, let's go ahead and do full screen, screen projector view. Right, to start off the lecture, we first need to, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Do I have anything in Java running because that was my system just spiking all of a sudden for some reason. So OBS is, but do I have any like, Okay, nothing exciting going on from IntelliJ because I was using, I was doing something in the other class, but I wanted to make sure that there was nothing really going on over here. Um, hmm. Okay, so one of the things that, uh, so if you remember from last week, we were doing uh, Huffman encoding, which was the idea that we could take text, and, uh, a giant block of text, and create a tree out of it that would encode stuff. So, um, and we basically, we'd, we'd encode it by giving each number a different, uh, sorry, by giving, you know, each uh, character a different bit sequence, right? Each character has a different bit, bit sequence, if you remember, right? I went over how, like, Capital A has a bit sequence of 97, right? No, that's lowercase a, has a bit sequence of 97, right? And then uh, 98 for B, and they have the same number of bits, although A appears more than B, right? And E appears more than A and more than Z. So each character basically has uses up the same number of bits. And the idea here is, well, with Huffman encoding, why don't we just simply... Uh, Instead, change it so that we've got the same number, uh, sorry, use a different number of bits for each character. Let the least common bits occur, uh, uh, sorry, use the le less common characters have less bits, sorry, more bits, right? So if you appear less often, then we can gi give you a longer bits, bit length. But if you're very often, then you want to use less bits so you're, so that you're, the message is as short as possible. Right, so let's go ahead and look at um, something like, uh, so it's tradition, typically what we do is that we don't give you like a whole bunch of text with like, uh, like um, we don't give you like something to actually transform it. And uh, like we don't give you uh, like a paragraph and tell you, hey, count all the characters in this paragraph. By the way, there's like 10 characters in this paragraph, so you have to make, you know, something that's pretty large. So Instead, why don't we instead we give you like gibberish and then have you encode a word? That's typically how it work, works. Like I gave you banana last time, something and typically a, 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 an exam question and the question on final looks something like this, like uh, so uh, W R D. So you've got basically these letter frequencies W R D L Q uh, O. I'll use capital Q just because it's it's easy to confuse that with A. So when I write it, at least, because I'm terrible. Um, w R D L Q O. So we may give you like, okay, so W appears 20 times, uh, disappears, you know, uh, let's say 25 times, and then you've got uh, 15. And 15 over here, uh, and disappear, and these appear maybe like uh, 40 and 100 times, right? So we, maybe we've got this frequency count going over here. Okay, so I give you these frequency counts. So first thing, right? And I say, okay, so this is a document, a bunch of characters, right? And if we count up all the characters, you find that you've got 25 Ws, five, tw uh, sorry. Uh, 25 R's, 15 D's, 15 L's, 40 Q's, and 100 uh, O's. Now, first thing that we know about this is that we don't actually ever have to like encode A, B, or C, or E in this in our tree. We don't have to like have to come up with character combinations for this because in our document those that don't exist, right? Just like if you were making a Huffman tree of Gadsby, which is the novel about the with, about the letter E, we wouldn't have to have a character combination for the letter E. So we can leave out what we don't need. Okay? Um, 
And what we can do for our characters is that we can, if we are encoding this, we can pass along this, this frequency a table to whoever we're sending a message to or whoever's sending the compressed document to so they can re reproduce the, the Hoffman tree itself, which isn't too expensive. So, um, so and generally these, these are like thousands. Each of these are thousands long so or something. And one of these has like maybe tens of thousand characters, in which case, you know, the, the amount of space it, it tells you to say how many characters each of them have is pretty small and compared to the, you know, so the amount you save in, in compressing is pretty significant to the amount that you're wasting in overhead by having to tell them what the character counts are. So first thing, so how do we create a Huffman tree for doing Huffman encoding? Okay, so like, so say you're giving this on the exam and I say draw, and the question, and it's probably gonna be a two-part problem. It's always a two-part problem. The first thing is draw the Huffman tree that corresponds to these this frequency count, and then it will be, uh, the second part is either decode or encode something. So I'll say maybe uh, the second part of this is encode the, uh, the word the string word, W-O-R-D, okay? So let's go ahead and start. So the first thing we have to do is arrange this in a priority queue, right? Which means we have to sort these things. So uh, D and L have the same, you know, they have the same character frequency. So uh, that's when you probably raise your hand and go, hey, professor, uh, which one goes first? And then I answer you, I'm like, oh, crud, I didn't think of that. Uh, it doesn't matter. I'll grade them both the same, right? Because it does. In that case, it does, in the case like this, it really doesn't matter. I'll be able to tell you, or I might, or I might have thought of it, and I told, and I'll tell you. Uh, use the rule of the alphabet. Is that alphabeticals are first, right? So if it's so if it comes first alphabetically, it goes, the, it, it goes first. So that's the rule we'll use here. In case of tie, we'll, we're going to break alphabetically. So, uh, so W R, so W and R, had twenty and twenty five. And then we had D and L, which had 15 apiece, right? Okay, so really, why does it, it's not really focusing on that, unfortunately. This is a pain. So 15, 15, 20, 25. I promise it will get better as I go along. Okay, so you've got it in a priority queue now. So now we dequeue the first two things in the priority queue, okay? First thing, and we create, and we put them into a single, Node, right? Each of these things is an individual node, and the node contains the symbol and the weight of the tree. So, um, so D has the weight of 15, and L has a weight of 15, and then they have a combined weight of 30, right? So we dequeue them both, and then we reinsert the the new a new node which has the, both those things we dequeued as a child as children into the node and has a combined weight of, uh, so we'll put this as DL in some way just so I can mark it. It's a combined weight of 30. Now, common error that I see on exams is that people will either leave it, uh, put re, they'll, re, they'll put it back into the priority queue and they'll either leave it in the, in the back or they'll put it into the front because so many of the examples uh, I've done, it simply re gets reinserted into the front because it will have a low frequency. But this one has a combined frequency of 30. Right, so we got to reinsert it into the proper place. You've got W, you've got R, 20, 25, Q has a frequency of 40, so it's got to go between R and Q. We've got W, we've got R, so 20, 25, and then D, L, and 30. So, okay, so now we've got W and R. So W and R, they need to that, uh, get popped off and combined into their own tree, which will be, which will have a combined weight of 35, sorry, 45. This is actually going to get messy. Ooh. So 45 will have to go between 100, and so we reinsert that into the tree, so underscore W, R. 45, and then O, and this is one I wouldn't necessarily ask, but I find it a great in illustration because it's going to get really messy in a couple seconds because I'll have to erase and redraw because the lines are about to crisscross like crazy. So uh, so now we've reinserted D, L, and Q. So this goes on the left, this goes on the right, 
This is Q, and they have a combined weight of 70, right? So we take, pop those both off, combine them, combined weight of 70, put that in here, okay? So I'll just put a dash here. So we've got 45, and then we've got the big one, and then we've got O. So 45, so you pop off 45, which needs to go onto the right, onto the left, and then we've got to pop off the big one that goes onto the, or DQ the big one, and that goes onto the right. Issue is that basically they're, I've drawn them in the opposite ways they need to be, right? Right, this one needs to be on the left, this one needs to be on the right. Right, if we're combining them into a single node, this one needs to be on the right, this one needs to be on the left, which looks particularly distasteful. So I'm just going to erase this one and do 45 R W. Okay, and now that we don't have that going on. Everybody understand why I had to do that? It's, it was it was less about me doing it was less about the algorithm failing and more about me being limited to you know drawing trees with straight lines in order for it to be understandable. So um, this has a, this gets combined in one big thing which has a combined weight of uh, more than 100, right? So 115. So we pop off the O, we pop off the big thing, and it gets combined into. Uh, into the last one, so that doesn't that weight doesn't really matter. Okay, so now we assign labels: zeros on the left, ones on the right. Okay, so now let's go ahead and encode the word the word world. Or typically, what I'll do is I'll give you um, a Although typically what I do instead is I give you a bit combination of one I've already solved and I'll feed it to you and ask you to decode it. And generally the way that the reason I do that is that it serves as a kind of a check because if you do it and there's stuff left over. Um, sorry. If I do it and there's stuff left over, then that's not a great that's not great because really was I recording from this again? I thought I turned it off. Okay, so let me just go ahead and just check the volume on this. Okay, so it's still recording from the mic. So there we go. Um, so, so, I'll give, so I'll give you basically something, a bit combination as it's just a decode because, you know, you will decode the letters and then you'll decode the letters and you'll go, oh, that's gibberish. What? Why is it gibberish? It, sh it shouldn't be gibberish. It should be like a valid English word that, I get, that you should be able to decode. Or it will be like, huh, I have like two bits left over. And that will let you know, oh, I didn't draw my tree correctly. So maybe I should go back uh, if I have the time at the end of the exam to fix this. Because um, <coughs> the way it works is that no matter what you draw for the tree, so long as you can show you can encode or decode correctly based on, based on whatever tree you had, I'll give you points for that, but not necessarily for the tree, right? So depending on what you encode or decode, that, that will just depend on what you were able to draw. Um, right, so um, next thing. So let's go ahead and like say, though, that you're encoding world. So W is one, uh, sorry, word, one, zero, zero. So the message you would send is one, zero, zero, and then Word, then O would, would be another would be another zero, and then one zero one, and then uh, for D it would be one one zero zero. So you would send me one one. So you'd send me uh, one zero 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 one zero one and one one zero zero. So there's plenty of other examples for helping encoding. So please. You know, look them up. Um, but I just wanted to go over that one more time before we moved on to chapter seven, which is by far my favorite chapter because I may be a bit biased because it's hash tables, and I did happen to do my dis my dissertation on distributed hash tables. So, kind of, sort of related. So, uh, I'm going to pull up the slides um, on that, and then I will promptly like forget about them at some point. And then we'll...
build a hatch hash table from scratch because that's one of the things I can do um, because it's not actually terrible. Um, now I like hash tables because they're kind of a like an example of just how you would just take a big problem and then create a hack to solve the big problem but leave yourself with the smaller problem and then create a hack to, to solve the smaller problem and get yourself even a smaller problem and, and so on and so forth until you get something that actually works and you're kind of surprised that it works. Uh, so, uh, and you kind of need this to do like any of the really crazy stuff that we really like doing. Um, so it says this chapter is on. So let's do F5 and then change the perspective. Come on. All right, this is the wrong one. There we go. I was hitting the wrong key combinations for it. Sets and maps. So uh, typically you don't necessarily deal, just like you don't necessarily deal with the heap directly, you don't necessarily deal with the hash table correctly. You build with the stuff, you use the stuff you build with it. So mats and sets, uh, you will build, um, you know, basically we use hash tables to build mats and sets. Um, for the time lab, I don't think we're going to go over map, maps and sets. It really depends on how far we go into them, especially since you haven't had the chance to practice with them. So the time lab will probably be on trees or heaps, right? So trees and or heaps. So just be sure able to do like, you know, know the add method and stuff. Um, but um, there will, but it'll be a couple of just basically it'll go over some recursive stuff. I'm going to try to make it as reasonable as possible, I feel. And of course, if it's, if it ends up being a absolute slaughterhouse, we'll figure out what, what to do from there. Okay. So, um, so how do we understand uh, maps and set interfaces and how we use them? We also want to learn about hash coding and it's used to facilitate uh, good insertion, removal, and search. And then study two forms of hash tables, open addressing and chaining, and understand their relative benefits and performance trade-offs. So that's where we're going to go. Uh, there is one more thing I do want to do before I carry on with this, though, that I remembered about in trees, which is the last algorithm, right? All the algorithms you're doing with, with were like going left and right and stuff. But I didn't go over one algorithm that I should go over, which is like, how do I like, uh, so let me just boot this up, okay? Because I realize this is important because I want to ask this type of question on there. Okay, so this is a, actually a pretty good one. So sorry for jumping the gun on the hash tables and seeming unorganized because I am unorganized right now. My entire weekend was miserable and it, I basically had one of the worst weeks ever. But, um, but <laughs> um, been pretty terrible. So let's go ahead and grab the, uh, just the tree code before we go on from that. So... Uh, trees, right? Binary tree over here. So uh, we've had we basically worked on creating this binary tree, but now let's say we want to uh, like do something in the tree, like maybe um, you know like go over it, go through the tree, and like so. So basically, I said there were two types of algorithms to deal with in the tree, right? The first to the algorithm to go through in the tree is like doing something like we've been doing for Adam and remove, which is search left, search right, like go through basically until you hit the point in the tree you need to hit. The thing I didn't go over in the trees, but I realized I needed to, was like, what about those traversal algorithms? Like, what about something like counting all the nodes in the tree, right? So maybe, right, we could return size to figure out like the size of the tree, but suppose we weren't keeping track of the size. So suppose we weren't keeping track of the size. And in fact, I think I've completely forgotten to increment the size at every single opportunity. Right, so, you know, good job, Andrew, right? Um, so what? If, so I can't just return this dot size in that case, right? In that case, I need a recursive function, right? I need to figure out the size of this tree, okay? So first off, though, since it's a tree function, we know we should probably handle this recursively, so let's go ahead and make a recursive method. So let's figure out what the size of this tree is taking in a, uh, you know, this dot root. You know, figure out the size of the tree starting at this dot root, which is always the thing we have to do when we're dealing with, like, recursive functions like this. Uh, node E root. Okay. 
Okay, so how do I like go ahead and check all like figure out what the size of the of the tree is like from a recursive point of view? Okay, so um, let me go ahead and actually draw a nice tree over here. Oh, hey, something that's hey, that's much better. Okay, so we've got a node, right? That's the side, that's a tree, right? We've got some root node here. It's got a left subtree, a left subtree, and a right subtree. Okay, and it wants to know how big it, the, the entire tree is, right? It wants to know its entire size. So how can it go about doing this in a recursive manner? Any thoughts? So what's the base case of, of a tree? Yes? The nodes are empty. Yeah, the nodes are empty. If I asked you what the base case of this tree is over here, I right. notice I'm pointing to empty space, then it's uh, pretty straightforward. So I guess that's our base case, right? First thing you got to do with a recurse function is the base case. So if root equal equals null, well, I guess I better return zero. Okay. Next case. So, okay. So now if it's not null, there's some more information that we do know. So Information that I do know is that this guy, right, is uh, that is that I'm I'm at least one node, right? So the size of this tree is at least one thing big, right? So um, int myself is equal to one. Okay, that that much I know. So I know the size of myself. Okay. So what other, so now that I've got this, how can I go about finding my left side and my right size then? Yes? All sides on your left and right? Yeah, call sides on my left and right. Figure out how big my left and right are by asking them the same function. If they're null, I'm going to get zero back. Otherwise, they're going to count themselves, and then they're going to, then they'll figure out how to count their children, right? Right now, I'm figuring out how to count my, how to get for my children. I'm going to be lazy about it. Remember, recursion's all about being magically lazy, which is that I'm going to figure out my own size. Then I'll say, hey, int left size is equal to, well, whatever the size of root dot left is, right? And then my right size, right size is equal to whatever the size of root dot right is. Okay, and then I guess I should just return uh, myself, um, right, myself plus uh, left size plus the right size, so one plus, so I returned all those three things added together, and that's my, and that's the size of the entire uh, tree or subtree, right? It's myself, left side, and right side. So why does this work? Well, because in here, Right, because in here, maybe this one is, let's go ahead and define this one a bit better, right? You've got maybe an entire subtree over here which has five nodes in it, okay? Then you've got, okay, so maybe we've got this situation over here, okay? So root calls itself and it says, okay, I'm not null. I figure out my, set, my own size. My own size is one, okay? But in order to, uh, to give the full answer back, i got to figure out what the size of my left subtree and the right subtree is. I'm going to go ahead and say, okay, um, let's see. I'll go ahead and draw this over here. Okay, so let's go ahead and do, do my left sub subtree. So my left subtree says, okay, well, I am one node, okay? So I'm going to, so I know myself, I'm going to compute my left side and my right side. Okay, I'm going to call sides on them to figure out how big they are. So left side goes, well, I'm one node. I'm going to call uh, so left side to figure out how big I am, then my right side to figure out how big they are. So left side goes, OK, I'm one guy. I call my children. He returns 0. He, my, left, my right side returns 0, so I'm 1. This guy goes, great. So I'm 1 plus my left side, which is, which is 1, and my right side, which returns 0, because that's empty. So I return 2. Okay. So he'll go. So this guy over here will go, OK, so I've got a left size is equal to 
z is equal to 2. My right size does the side size does the same thing and returns 5. So 2 plus 5, right? It's not 7 here because of course I add 1 for myself. 8, right? So the size of this subtree is 8. So, so now root's going, okay, so I did my left recursive call. Now I do my right recursive call. So this tree would get all there and it would do, it would figure out it has one node over here, another node over here. These guys would return one because this is zero, this is zero, this returns one, this is zero, this is zero, so it returns one plus zero plus zero. So this says, aha, myself plus my right plus my left is equal to three. So the entire tree size is equal to 11, right? And that makes sense because we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then we say that this entire left triangle hanging over here is five, right? So seven plus five, right? I didn't bother wanting, I didn't want to draw five more nodes over here, so kind of the idea, right? Just wanted to, yes? Yes, because, of course, I forgot to count myself in this one, right? So 12. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, plus 5 is equal to 12, right? Easy mistake to make. And so basically, so again, there's just two algorithms for a binary search tree, okay? The, it's the left, it's searching for a specific node in there. But more commonly on exams, I give you a problem like this, which means go through every single node in the tree. It's actually fairly straightforward. It always follows this format, which is uh, recursive, like, okay, figure out what your base case is. What if the root is equal to null? What if the node that, you, that you're that you currently at is the dead end, right? Otherwise, do you, does, your does your information matter, right? Figure out if what you need matters. Like, maybe you're counting the, all, all, the number of nodes that have even, that have, maybe it's a binary tree of integers, right? And you're computing, uh, whether or not, you know, you're counting the num number of nodes that have even integers in them, okay? In which case, you ask yourself, okay, is my thing even, okay? Then figure out how many things in the left side of my tree have evens, and how many things in the right side of my tree have evens. Or how, maybe it's a binary tree of strings, okay? And maybe I'm counting the number of strings that have, uh, that basically have, like, words stored in them that are greater than five lengths. So, I check, is my, my word greater than five length? If it is, you know, I do my left and then my right. Or maybe basically I figure out, you know, how many things have, you know, maybe I'm trying to do like some weird kind of function where I'm counting things in my left and my right and then comparing them and then turning and then passing it to my parent, right? If that's the case, then, you know, uh, uh, then that's another thing. So there is a, uh, a lot of, so there's a lot of questions basically that basically are answered by just consider myself and recursively call the same function on my left side and then my right side and then combine the results together, right? That's the same thing as like printing out stuff in a pre in uh in a pre-order traversal, right? I do myself and I pre-order traverse my left and then my right. Maybe it will have to be in order, right? So that's something that might have to happen, right? So basically, most of the, it's not much of a spoiler to tell you that, or, or much of a, I mean, I tell this to every class, that basically the way to solve it is just, you know, this is the function that gets used, and pretty much you just, if you can do this on the exam, you're probably going to be all right, and set this up on the exam, you're probably going to be all right for the coding, because the coding isn't too hard. It's either doing this, or something similar to the add function, and it's hard to come up with hard, with unique problems that don't already exist for searching for something. So most of the time we do something like count the number of nodes in the tree. I, this, this was a test question in the past. Count, you know, figure out the size of the tree recursively without using, you know, dot size. Okay. Um, so um, that's just something to be, that I wanted to make sure. Okay. So that's going to take O of N time to do. And remember, trees take O of N time, O of log N. So we were going, I was jumping into maps. And the special thing about them, why would we learn anything else? Anything else? Because log n seems fast enough, right? Well, the answer is we can possibly get even faster with, with uh, maps and sets, which have constant time, insertion, deletion, and searching. But we have to make some sacrifices. Two big sacrifices here. Um, the first sacrifice is that we have to sacrifice space in order to do this. We have to sacrifice 
we will be explicitly be throw, you know, wasting a bunch of empty space. Um, and more so than an array list. We like it's built in that we have to sacrifice empty space in order for this to work reason reasonably well. The second thing we have to you know sacrifice is any semblance of maintaining the data in order, right? If you want to keep stuff in order, then you need a tree. And that's the best you can do. If you want to keep stuff in order, you need a tree. If you don't care about the order, maps the way to go. But if you care about order, you got to use a tree. So you can so you can actually uh, implement maps and sets using trees, and that's how Java has two different sets and two different maps. That's where where Java uses it. You have a hash map and a tree map, and a hash set and a tree set, and those are the are whether or not you care about your data being ordered. But this chapter is about hash tables. Um, so, and you're going to see that basically if you had used a map in, uh, for your, that actually maps are kind of ridiculously easy at completing your current homework problem, which is the index tree. So if you use a map for this, you can actually do that. It actually just kind of falls out pretty easily. Um, no, we've got to use a tree for this one. Uh, it's, it's worthwhile to learn how to do it with a tree because you need the practice. To, I mean, you want the practice for for the time lab and the exam. But speaking of the exam, um, probably, let's see, what time would that be? Uh, exam uh, earliest will be next week. Latest it will be is April 6th, or, well, Thursday and Friday, right, 5th and 6th, right? So I'll let you guys know. If you don't, guys don't get a practice exam like the week beforehand, then you can pretty much be sure that's the week after that, so, because I always like giving out practice exams. So, but generally I give my second exam right after we learn trees, and we'll just see basically if it's going to incorporate maps as well. Okay, so, um... So lists are indexed, meaning stuff in there have an order, right? So, you know, you can go through it and iterate through it in a reasonable manner. Um, searching through it is O of n time to find something in the list, except if it's sorted, which takes log n time. Um, but sets are even better than that. Uh, sets take constant time. Sets don't have indices. Sets don't care about the insert, the order in which you put items in there. They are... You know, pretty fantastic, actually. Um, and they, you can remove elements without having to shift stuff around in a set. They're, we're going to learn about these things as magic boxes, and then we're going to try to figure out how do we build them. So, um, and, and so what is a set? Well, if you take how many, I mean, everybody's taking basic concepts of mathematics, right? Right, the basic, basic CS math concepts class. Everybody's taking that. Then you probably know. Then you probably know exactly what I'm talking about when I say a set. Okay. Um, sets are these collections, right? There's the abstract set, and you can either do a hash set, or which is what we're going to be learning about, or a tree set. But sets are, you know, these mathematical structures that basically say, you know, here is is a set, right? Here's a set A, B, right? And here's the same set, right? Order doesn't matter when it comes to set, right? Right? There's, there's, a, there's. Uh, so these are basically. So let's say set, uh, set x is equal to a b. Set y is equal to b a. And if I were to ask, is a equal to y? Sorry, is x equal to y? You would say yes. They're the same set because they have the same content. Order does not matter in regards to sets, right? Okay. Um, so let's say set Z is equal to um, is equal to uh, C. This is just simply to make sure, or C D. Let's just make sure we're on the same page here, right? If I were to say, uh, if I were to ask you what was X union Z, right? You'd reply something along the lines of A B C D, or maybe C D A B, or maybe D A B C. But basically, so long as all four elements of the sets of the set where it was in the in your output, it really doesn't matter. Sets don't care about your output. Right? They, sorry, they don't care about uh, your um, order. Okay. Um, right. And so going back to this over here, when I when I you know if I go over to this to this over here and ask you what's the index of a, what's the index of a in here? You're you're gonna go how huh, what? Because that's a nonsensical question. Right? You don't have indices in sets, 
right? That doesn't matter. Um, and what order was th were things added into the set? Well, you couldn't keep track of that because the order in sets doesn't matter. So you can swap it around however. Uh, so let's go ahead and like look at how you know the Java set. Um, so let's go ahead and create a new package. So destruct. Um, so let's see. Code new package. Let's call it hash. And then new class set example. So what we're going to do is we are going to do public stack void main. Okay, and now let's see how we would how let's look at the uh, just the set class. Okay, so set. Um, so let's say set set. So it's a set of elements. So let's say a set of um, of integers. Right. Let's just keep it simple. Set of integers set is equal to a new, and then you can either do hash set or tree set. I'm going to do hash set over here of integer. And it's upset because I didn't import set as well. So you have to import, just like list, you would, just like list, you can either have a linked list or an array list. Sets can have hash set or tree set, but you're probably going to use a uh, hash set. So let's go ahead and add, actually, yeah, let's do strings instead because honestly, otherwise it's going to, I won't get to show you how that th things don't stay in order. It will keep integers in order just because of the way hashing works, but, which is a mysterious word that will just, You'll just say like blockchain all the time just to make it sound cool. No, I'm not kidding. Actually, hashing has an actual meaning, uh, and uh, it, it, but it's going to com come up a lot. Um, so set dot. So we've got a bunch of methods here. We've got add all, which you know is from collections, which says you know pretty much add everything to the set. Add clear contains all contains is empty. It has an iterator, it has a size, it has a remove, remove all. And you know, notice it doesn't have like a union operator or a intersection operator. Uh, it's because I don't know why they didn't bother doing that, but they, they call but union is at all, essentially. So but you'll see that everything else. So let's just go ahead and start like set dot uh, add um, hello. So let's go ahead and add hello to the set, and then we're going to do uh, set dot add uh, world and add that to the set, right? Okay, so let's go ahead and run this program. Okay, so. We add hello, and then we add world, and it, so the so first line is the set, and then adding a second one, you get hello world. Let's go ahead and add uh, the words foo and uh, bar, boz, set, babble. Fred, whoop, just a bunch of nonsense words, but let's go ahead and add them, and then let's go ahead and and let's print out the set again. So, uh, set, okay. So now, hello world, and then you've got bar hello food babble boz Fred whoop and world. You may notice that basically that uh, the orders kind of all. Not it's not random. Like there looks like there might be some meaning to it because a lot of words do appear before others. Bar does become before Boz, but like you added hello and world first, but now bar's the first thing in there. Right? Right? No, so notice that basically the order's all different. Now mind you, it's deterministic, especially in the case of strings. Right? They're gonna end up in the same place no matter what. But you're not gonna add um but, but the order doesn't matter. It's using its own internal organizational scheme by uh, using something called hashing, which we're going to 
really dive deep into. So it uses hashing to figure out where the, uh, what order everything's going to be in. So that everything is efficiently placed in such a manner that basically that these add methods took constant time to do. Okay. Um, so another thing to know about sets is that as mathematical sets, you only have ev only ever have one item in there. So remember how you know set how how we've always had the add method for all of our other methods. Sorry, all of our other objects return true, right? It always returns a boolean, and we'd say, okay, it returns true. And you'd be wondering why does it bother? Why do we bother even having a boolean anyway if it's always going to return true, right? Well, the answer is because some collections, such as set, return false. Because when you add something to a set, let's go ahead and uh, add whoop again. You only ever get to keep one copy of any item in a set, right? Sets. Right? And think about that all the way back to mathematical sets. You only have ever one copy of anything in there. So I add whoop a bunch of times, but it only shows up once. And in fact, if I do uh, s out add whoop over here, it's going to print out false, meaning we unsuccessfully added it. Sorry, we weren't successful in adding it because uh, it was already there. So add returns true if it's, if, it's al if it's not already, if we can insert it, and false if we couldn't insert it because it was already there. Yes? Nope. You can add. Can, well, you can just do. Well, what it will use in that case is dot equals. I mean, it uses dot equals anyway to check to make sure. Just make sure it's not equal to anything else. Sets don't care about comparability, right? All that care, all that you care about is like, are these objects the same? And it uses dot equals in that case to check to make sure. Hey, were these things the same word? So it returns false in that case. So okay, so that's cool. It's constant time, but what does that? I mean, does that really? you know, do anything for us. So let's go back all the way to our big O examples where basically I had this, uh, you know, I had this uh, R unique thing. And if you remember at the end of that, I was talking about how knowing the proper data structure could really help with, uh, with solving problems, right? If we had a list of items in our list, right? What I said is let's create a new hash set and hash sets have Right, so typically what we do for do to check for uniqueness is right, you you check, you go through each item, right? You go through, you take an item and then you go through each item, other item, and compare them, right? You would you would say, okay, for the first item, let me check it against the second item, third item, fourth item, fifth item. So let me check it against the other n items. And then you go to the second item and say, let me check it against the other n minus one items. Then third item and check it against the other n minus one items, right? You check it, each item against all the other items to make sure it's unique, right? With a set though. You can sets are like really useful as kind of checklists, as ways of storing data to see if you've seen that data before. So here, instead of having an O of n time algorithm, what I've done, sorry, O of n squared algorithm, I created a set, and I said, hey, does the set already contain the item? That's a constant time check. Does the set already contain the check, uh, item? If it does, return false. Otherwise, I add it to the set, which is a constant time. So each item, I did a constant time check to see if it was there, if I've already seen it before, right? because the set is just stuff I've seen. And then I add to the set if I haven't seen it yet. And so if I get to it and I've seen it, then I can check in constant time it's there and return false. Otherwise, I go through all the n items and just return it. So using a set can speed, seriously speed up your, your uh, run times mm -hmm. if you, for checking like if you've seen something. If you've, so basically checking if all the things in, something, in a collection are unique, sets are the way to go. Um, you know, it, it's fantastic. Uh, so what kind of uh, methods can we do with these? Um, well, it's essentially, yeah, it's essentially the math set, as I mentioned. It is, it contains no duplicate elements and has at most one null, right? So you can have a null set as well. So adding apples to the set, apples, oranges, pineapples will do nothing to it, right? So all the stuff that you know about sets for mathematics still apply. You have testing to see if something's in the set, right? But instead of using the weird small e, um, e membership symbol, you're using uh, the contains method. Adding and removing items from the set are done with the add and remove method. Union, intersection, difference, and subset are all there, but they are just named differently. So just to review, 
a uh, union. So if you've got a if you've got a and b, uh, uh, a union b is the combination of both the items in there. So we've got one three five seven and two three four five. If you union them, you're going to get one two three four five seven. Um, notice that we're not going to that it contains all the items in a, all the items in b. It doesn't contain five twice, right? Because you can only have one thing in the output. The intersection of two items is only the element in common, right? Uh, right? So if you remember those Venn diagrams, it's that middle shaded section that we care about, right? So the intersection between B and B is one, three, five, seven, and the intersect intersected with two, three, four, five. So we go, well, one's not in both, three is in both, so it's in the output, five is in both, so it's in the output, seven's in, in on both, so it's in the output, so it's not in the output, two's not in both, three's in both. Four is not on both. Five is not on both. So how long does this take? Well, it takes basically how, however many elements there are to check for it, right? So it takes the size of A plus the size of B to do this. So you've got three and five because those are what appear in both of them. The difference is removing everything from A that appears in B. So if you do one, three, five, seven minus two, three, four, five, you you're going to remove all the elements from A that appeared in B, which is 3 and 5, so you get 1 and 7. It's kind of the inverse of – it's well, not really the inverse because you don't get 2 and 5 as well, but you remove 1 and 7, right? So you – sorry, you remove 3 and 5 from this, right? So you end up with 1 and 7. Uh, 2, 3, 4, 5 minus 1, 3, 5, 7, well, uh, is 1 in there, so no, remove it. 3 is in there, so remove it from the output. Five is not is in front, is in there, so we remove it from the output. Uh, seven is in, is not in there, so we're not removing it. So we removed three and five, so we're left with two and four. Difference basically, and honestly, the difference method is given a much better name in Java. I I don't like what they did for union and intersection, but I like what they did, which is remove all over here. So basically, this would be a dot remove all b, which says remove all these items from the set. And A is a subset of B if everything in A is also in B. So, it, you know, that's that's something you should – that was one of the more easier things from math concepts as you know subsets pretty well. Um, so, you know, essentially testing to see if you're inside a set, testing an empty set, determining the set size, and creating an iterator over a set. Oh, that's a question. How do I go over – how do I go through all the items in the set if I don't have indices, right? I can't do 4 int i is equal to 0. i is less than, you know, i is equal to set uh, – i is less than set that size, right? Uh, i plus plus, right, and then go like uh, set dot get index i. That's not going to work. Here you actually need to use the for each loop. So for uh, – so for string uh, word in set, That's actually the way you have to do it uh, if you're iterating through everything in the set. You have to use an iterator, which means that you can – that pretty much if you want to use a for loop, you have to use the for each loop to go through it. Yes? Uh, I don't know if you already went over this, but can you explain more why um, when you add like the values to a, to a hash set, um, why they come out almost randomly? I cannot go over that right now. Actually, I have to that that, that gets in. It gets into the basically the way that uh, it gets into a hash into the way hash tables are, are built. Oh. Essentially, it's just putting things in a, an area where it can figure where it can use black magic to figure out where it is in a very uh, in a very fast format. And we're going to learn what that black magic is or how that black magic is created. But it's still kind of black magic. Okay, so. Um, Contains all is the is the subset operation, and then add all, retain all, and remove all are union, intersection, and difference. And those will uh, return true if if there was a change to the set. Otherwise, it will um, it returns false. But basically, it does modify the set. It doesn't return a new set. It modifies the set. So there's examples they can go through, but I mean they're fairly straightforward. Set A dot add all set B will give us back will give us 
you know, Ann, Jill, Sally, Bill, and Bob, right? Because they're Jill and Ann are already in there. Right? If the if a copy of set A is in set A copy, then set A copy that retain all set B, that would output uh, Jill and Ann because we'd only retain the items that are both in both. Right. So big thing to remember about sets is that um, is that lit, list dot add um, will, will always return true. Set dot add returns false if you do a duplicate. And you have to use a for each loop to go through um, this. And there's pretty much the order is pretty much arbitrary. Okay, so that's a set. Sets are fairly straightforward. Okay. Maps on the other hand require a bit of juggling around, so I'm going to actually change the programming language completely at the moment for just a couple seconds because uh, some of you may have worked in Python and therefore know what a set is, right? I'm going to be use, I use a lot of terms for this, right? I use map some, a lot for, for this. I use hash table a lot. Uh, Python uses a third term, which is called the dictionary. So if you've used a, how many of you have used a dictionary in any programming language? So at least one of you has, yep, some of you. So dictionary, so it's easy to show off because, you know, Python doesn't have arrays, it has lists, right? So if I were to create an empty list like this, I could say L is an empty list and L dot append uh, one, L dot append, uh, you know, five, and it'll give me this list one and five in there, right? And L, and if I ask for the zero, sorry, the zero index in there, it's going to return one. If I ask for uh, the item at index one, it's going to return five, right? It's just a list, right? Um, L dot, um, L is equal to list range zero to 100 by twos. There's all the numbers from one to, uh, from zero to 99, um, right? So, I ask for L of um, 30, sorry, L 30, it would return 60, right? If I ask for uh, 50, it's going to go out of bounds because there's only 49, because there's 50 elements in there, right? So, and I can't go L, you know, works the same way in Java, in Java and Python, where I can't like just go out of bounds and, just, and add one more element to the end. I have to actually use a specific command for that. So. That is that. But what about this whole idea of um, of uh, lists that it was of dictionaries that I was just talking about? So what is a dictionary? Well, a dictionary I'll use D to represent a dictionary is represented by pair of colons, and they're actually pretty interesting here. They're easy to illustrate here because they work very they work very much the same, but the syntax is quite different in Python. Um, but I like this because it illustrates the points. A dictionary is essentially like a much more generalized array, right? Arrays create a mapping from an indice to a value, right? So for in L, we've got all these index zero holds the value zero, index two holds the value, so index one holds the value two, index uh, five holds the value 10. And if I do this, I say overwrite that this mapping, index five will now hold the value foo. Right, and now if I change it to zero, two, four, six, eight, foo, right? Because Python, it, it doesn't care about data types. It's this weakly typed language, which is both a blessing and a curse. So um, now a dictionary, on the other hand, it creates arbitrary mappings. So I can say, and you create them just basically whenever you want on the fly. So I can say that basically uh, that d of so D4 is equal to red. So the key four maps to the value red. So now I've got a mapping between four and red. So now if I ever ask for, for uh, the value associated with four, it will return red. If I ever ask for the value associated with red, it'll tell me there's no value associated with red because it's a one-way kind of relationship here, right? Red, a four maps to red, right, is a key like given this key, given this ID, I'll get this value for you, okay? Given this, um, and once you understand this, you'll understand things like why in the world do I have an ID number, right? So uh, given maybe the value, uh, 
maybe give you given the value let's see let's see um, blue I return that's the color of the sky right so now if I ask for right not the variable blue because it's asking me that's asking if I want the variable blue but for the string blue it will return that's the color of the sky that's what's associated with it so I've created two associations here four maps to red blue maps to that's what the color of the sky is now this is a really weird concept just basically I'm creating essentially any random index like anywhere I want right and any so first off I can create any index I want d100 is equal to a thousand and it just and it will just create that right four blue and 100 are my indices here so not only can I just use numbers but I can use anything as my index and I can do it wherever I want to okay that's pretty cool right so I can create th that so what's the uh, kind of use for this well let's say that some mad professor has you counting up like you know doing a word count problem right where I'm telling you to count the free the number of times a word that words appear in a document okay let's see do I have um what do I have on over here do I have I have that so don't really have too much over there but let's say you've got a document you need to open and you need to count the words in it um, open I could open the file and then I could read it and say hey if I have the file in if the file exists as a map sorry if that word exists in the mapping like uh, if d dot keys because those are the right this is what we call a key value pair contains right, I can do d dot keys and that returns uh, four blue and a hundred dot contains 100 oh right that's not the way it works in Java it's uh, is 100 in d dot contains yes it does so um, is blue in d dot contains yes it is is or keys is red in the keys no it's not it's not in the keys right but it is in the values right red is one of the values right four goes to uh four goes to red so you've got essentially two sets in a map or in a dictionary you've got the keys and the value and we're kind of creating a binding between them in fact we're like kind of creating a function like right like f of right if you think about it like defining a function like f of x is equal to you know f of x is equal to return uh, 2 times x right we're creating a map from from a bunch of keys to a bunch of values just instantaneously I'm saying basically for a given function f if I give you a number I want to get you to give me twice that number right that's the, the key is x the value is 2x it's that kind of whole range domain thing that we all hated in math right here but here we're just basically saying we can just create what we need on the fly and it doesn't have to necessarily make any sense so that's cool um now in Java this is called a map and it I swear it's not as as hard as it, it looks hard but they're super useful once you get used to it so sets are related to map because we have a, a, a we're we basically conceptually have two things. We have a key set and a value set. Now that's not how we're going to program it. We just program it by basically um, smashing away at it until until we convince it to work. Okay. Uh, but a map is a set of ordered pairs whose elements are of keys and values. The keys have to be unique, but values don't have to be unique. Um, let's go back to the Python shell and right. We've got our dictionary which has four blue and one hundred. Right. If I said 100 if I say d100 is equal to 1 it doesn't add a second binding in there it just replaces what I had previously okay and I can also do d1 is equal to 1 and now both 100 maps to 1 and 1 maps to 1 so multiple items can go to the same multiple keys can go to the same value okay so here you've got a set that like here where j goes to Jane b1 and b2 sorry b and b2 go to Bill S goes to Sam and B1 goes to Bob, right? And this is pretty nice because I just like a set, this t the, these operations take 
constant time with a big shiny asterisk on it, just like set had that I didn't mention, which is that that's amortized because occasionally we have to resize and that will t and the resize operation will take O of n time just like an array list, but that's how it works. So um, essentially a map, uh, it's an onto mapping. So all the elements in the value set, set, so basically everything over here in value has a key associated with it. You can't just have random values floating around. So the map interface has basically a dot get method. Here's basically the two methods you use. Get method. So given a key, return a value associated with it. And then put a key and value in there and return the value you just put in there just to confirm it to the user. So get is the retreat. So instead of get and set, you have get input. Okay. So um, now there's a reason for these thing for what this key is because you know, it's not just kind of a one-to-one -one thing. We can do a, the key can be just like, the key is usually something pretty simple like a number, but the value can be very complex, right? You've got a student ID, right? I'll pull out my faculty ID, which is just the student ID, but with the red bar on top, which I always thought was really nice. So you've got a number on it, right? Mine has a number on it, right? And the idea here is before that number is that, well, it's very hard, well, you're probably, uh, your name's probably not not necessarily a special name. I mean, your name is special, right? I think it's my name is special, but your name from the from the university uh, systems perspective is probably not special in the sense that it's probably not unique, right? Your name um, is probably not a unique name, and your birth date is certainly not unique, right? There's only 365 days in the year, so uh, so. You know, using your birth date isn't necessarily a thing, and sometimes two people do have the same birthday on the same, you know, have the same name and have the same birth date, right? Uh, when I was in middle school, there was an Andrew Rosen who had just graduated uh, from eighth grade when I came in on, in sixth. So that was, uh, people kept asking me if I was related. I'm like, well, would I be related to somebody who has the same name as me? That doesn't make any sense, right? Unless that person was my grandfather, who I am actually named after. So, you know, it's just, it doesn't make any sense. So, um... So basically, if we were trying to look you up by your last name, right, that can be a bit troublesome, especially when it comes to FERPA, you know, federal privacy stuff. So I keep because I don't want you to ask, oh, are you the, are you the Andrew Rosen who lives, it, it, you know, in this street? Uh, no, but now I know that an Andrew Rosen does live on this street, which is a violation of federal law. Oops. Uh, so instead, we use ID numbers, right? ID numbers. So. Um, Instead, what we do is that we say, okay, give me your ID number. And what it does is that it pulls up student name, address, major, grade point average, right? It, none of these things are unique, are necessarily unique to you, right? So other people have a different name, may have the same name as you. Other people may have the same address, especially if you're living off campus, right? Different major, you, there's a lot of people in the same major as you, right? Like probably half the class, right? So uh, grade point average, probably not unique. Um, but the student ID number, that's guaranteed to be unique because we generate that for you. So we so uh, what we do is that we use that to look you up in the system, right? Your student ID number is used as a unique key that uniquely identifies you. It's not just because you're like, this is like a faceless machine that's turning out the students, right? And you're your student 0, 1, 2, A, right? It's not that. It's more of a matter of efficient lookup and retrieval. Same thing with an online store customer, right? You can have, if you want to keep your customers uh, separate and their accounts separate, Right. Uh, first off, you want to keep the customer can't necessarily go off the customer name or the address because multiple people might be ha uh, who have mul you know multiple people might have the same address. Right. You know, my wife and I both have Amazon accounts because we might want to buy something uh, buy a surprise for uh, for the other person without them knowing. So it's a good idea to have you know, separate accounts. Uh, different credit card information. Right. You and somebody else might share a credit card number. Right. Because you might be sh you know sharing a credit card. Right. For me, it's my wife and I share a credit card. My, you, you know, it's possible you and your parents share a credit card, right? So uh, that's not good enough to be unique. Shopping cart. Well, if a hot item is being on sale, then your your shopping cart contents are not necessarily unique because if everybody's buying the same item, well, that's kind of different. What is probably unique is your email address, though. The email address that you signed up with your account. So that's typically used as the key there. So given your email address, I can look up all the other stuff about you. Uh, for inventory items, uh, items can have, you know, the same names. B 
because manufacturers are terrible like that. Uh, quantities, manufacturer, the cost, the price, those are all not unique necessarily to the item, but in a specific ID, that's unique. Books, many books have the same title. Some, some authors can be the same. That, those aren't unique things. What is unique a lot of times for the lookup system is the IS, you know, ISBN number, right? That, that unique number that, gener that, that generates stuff. Okay, so um, the map, so basically that's what the key is. So the key can be, so the key value relation need, need not be simple. The key is generally something simple like a number or a string, and the value can be something pretty complex. It might be a list, um, or it might be just, or, or it could be something as simple as a number, or it could be just a object that holds a bunch of data. So the hierarchy is that we've got a map interface, and then if we care about, uh, about, um, a, about, stuff in the map being sorted or order in the map we'll use the tree map which just means we're actually just using a binary search tree which means we log in time but instead what we're probably going to end up doing is using a hash map which does stuff in constant time and we say the heck with order we don't care about it right your you you know your id number doesn't really mean anything about about what order you were in same with your email account number that probably doesn't correspond to anything to the order other than like when you got in line to get it, right? So uh, the maps, as far as our functions go, maps really, you know, as far as data structures goes, maps don't really have too many functions. You can ask if the map is empty. You can put stuff in the map. You can remove stuff from the map, and you can get something from the map, and you can ask how many uh, key value pairings there are. Okay. Um, and in a so let me just go ahead and build this over here. Um, build a map over here. How, how do you create a map? Well, it's the same way we, we'd create a set. Sad that I didn't get to start creating it today and go into the how this works. So map key value. So the big thing about, uh, so there's also two distinct things that we're learning in this chapter, which unlike other chapters are really a heck of a lot more distinct than we're learning. The first thing we're learning is how do we use maps, okay? We're learning briefly how to use maps. Then we're going to do uh, basically how do we build maps in great detail, in, in pretty good detail. And then we're going to go over again. Well, again, how do we use maps and sets to solve some interesting programming problems? Because it 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 got to it gets to a point in programming interviews where you go, wow, I can really use a, a map to make this easier. A lot of the final exam questions we don't you don't need to use a map for that. Like a lot of the programming questions on the final exam, I go, well, you don't need to use them. You don't need a map to solve these, but it sure makes your code a lot more efficient, and it sure makes your code a heck of a lot shorter if you use a map or a set to do these. So knowing how to do uh, do maps and sets, they make your life a heck of a lot easier. Now, unlike um, sets that take in one data type, maps use two. So right now I'm just going to use it without the generic. So map map is equal to new hash um, map. And notice that it says KV, right? So we're using one data structure for the, um, right? So we're going to use one data structure for the, uh, let's see, Alt Enter, import class. So we're using one data structure basically as the, um, at, sorry, we use one data structure for the keys. One, sorry, one object, one class as the key, and then one class as the, uh, what should we call it, as the value. So let's say we're doing the whole uh, student example right over here. So let's go ahead and create a basic uh, student class in the last, like, 10 minutes we have here. Something really stupid. Let's create a student, right? And the student has an int id num. Um, it has a int... Uh, so it has a string name, right? And then a string address. And that's all I'll keep for right now because, of course, there's the other things like GPA and stuff that you might want to keep in there. But right now, because I want to create it quickly, let's go ahead and do that. So can I, let's see, how do I gen automatically generate stuff <clears throat> in this code? Um, let's see, generate. Ah, there we go. Generate constructor for, okay. Oh, there we go. There we go. 
So given these things, we can create create one of these things. Great. So now let's say we want to do the, uh, do this. So given a we have a key. Let's go with a integer for your ID number, and then to a student. Okay. So let's go ahead and see, and let's say map dot put. So let's say the student's key is uh, four twenty uh, three five twenty four or something like that, and new student. And so we're gonna input this new student. So four twenty three five twenty four. His name is. Let's go with uh, uh, Boo Bar, and he lives on um, one two three CS Lane. Okay. So now let's go with another student, and we're going to go ahead and put him into the map. Let's go with uh, one. His ID is one. ID number is one. A, B, C, and they live on um, 3, 2, 1, alphabet lane, right, something like that. Okay, and now let's put in map dot put negative 1, new student, right, so we're just creating a new student object and we're just throwing it into the set or to the, um, the values. And, and, he, and their ID is negative 1. Um, the name is negative Nancy, and the address is y axis. Okay. Yeah, not the greatest jokes, but whatever. Okay, so let's go ahead and print out the map and see just what what gets stored in there. So um, negative one maps to a hash dot student why does it say hash dot well because we're in the package called hash um, so it says so I didn't create a two string method for this so let's go ahead and fix that so uh, alt I believe it's insert let's go ahead and do a two string okay cool let's go ahead and run the program again um, negative one maps to the student negative Nancy one maps to the student ABC, who lives on 321 Alphabet Lane, and this number maps to Furbar, who lives on 123 uh, CS Lane. So now, if I wanted to say get uh, map dot get, and now I put in the key uh, 423524, it will go ahead and run this, and it will return the student who's got the ID number 423524. Right, it sets up that that mapping between these two things. If I put in, if I put in something that doesn't exist, like five four twenty three five twenty three, it gives me null back because that's where what would map there. There's no no mapping there, so it returns null. Okay, so everybody kind of understand how that works. So um, so going back to your problem, right from from that I've just given you, creating an index of words, right? Uh, right. We had an index node that I was having you contain, which contained basically the word, the number of occurrence of the word, and the list of occurrences, right? Well, what you could do is that basically is you could use a map as the data structure pretty simple. You could, um, what you could do is you could use the map as the, so the key would be the word, the string, right? And the value would be uh, the number of times you've seen the word, you know, basically the number of times you've seen the word and the list of all the of all of where you've seen it all. So it so basically being able to take a problem and change change it into a key value kind of deal is pretty valuable. And that's a common problem actually. Word count using maps. Um, so how do we build these things? And I keep saying that they have constant time. Uh, notation, you know, that these things take constant time add and remove, and that seems pretty much magical, right? It shouldn't just be as simple as saying that. Um, and so what we do is that we use something called a hash table on the back end to build these things. Um, and we've got basically, 
an idea here. So the idea here is that we want to create and use anything as a key. It doesn't matter what it is, like an integer or a string or whatever. That's essentially going to be like the random index, okay? Well, so we need to figure out first off, first problem. How do I use any index as a key? Like any object as the index, essentially, even if it's not a number. Any suggestions? How do I use something that's not a number as like an index? It's a trick question, kind of. So the answer is, you can't use something that's not a number as an index. But fortunately for you, everything that's stored in a computer is what? Sorry? Binary. It's binary, which are? Binary. Numbers. Binary is a number. Anything stored in a computer is numbers. So worst case scenario, if you want to use something as a as a index, you just turn it into some sequence of numbers, right? And there's your index. Okay. So let's go ahead and and kind of just cover the really basic idea, and then we'll get back to here, and then we'll write down all the challenges with, with it on the next one. But right now, let's go ahead and go over the basic idea. The basic idea behind the hash table is basically we've got some, we want to map some keys to value, right? So the key is, an, is something abstract, but we can just turn that into an index. So let's just create a giant array, and I mean mega huge, okay? Let's say like infinitely big, okay? What we're gonna do is that we're gonna take some key, okay? We're gonna turn it into a number somehow, okay? And that's gonna give us an index that we could do in, in our, that we could use it for an array. We'll take this key, we'll transform it into an index, and then we're going to just throw it into this array. And that, if we can just do this like, we can take like random key and turn it into an index and because that's just an easy operation to do, then that's no problem uh, because then we've got an index to put something in. And that index, well, inserting something into an index and retrieving something in an index takes how much time? Constant time. So, a couple problems here. First off, I don't have infinite space, of space in my computer. I don't know how to transform something, some key into something else. So I don't, so that's a big problem. Don't know how to transform uh, any arbitrary thing into into a thing. I can't guarantee that the indices are unique, right? Because two things might end up in the same indice if I've got this transformation function going on over here. Oh, and by the way, I don't have infinite space on my computer. I probably barely. If I want this to be useful, I need to be sure that it, I can, you know, use this with like megabytes as opposed to gigabytes, right? So, yeah. And how many indices can I possibly store anyway? I can't store one of. How big can an array be? What can you what 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 gets used as an index? An integer. an integer, right? How big can an integer be? About two billion, which means that the biggest thing can be is two billion. So that <coughs> so even if I wanted it to be infinitely big, could it be? Why do I need it to be infinitely big? Well, because if I'm using any key, right, I need a place to store it, right? If I need to get any key, any key could get turned into a unique index. So we've got a lot of problems here. Can't too big, can't transform things. We don't know how to transform things. And even if we could, it wouldn't necessarily be unique. And then so you'd have things uh, stepping on each other's toes. All these problems need to be solved in order for this thing to be feasible, which I'll review again on Wednesday. So we're going to see how we can resolve this and how many different, and there's basically two different ways to resolve it. We'll learn about one of them. We'll learn about both of them, but one will go into detail.